Colin had a problem and a microphone to spare. Thomas took it up and so the podcast went to air. For weeks and months they trolled through every single DVD. They've unwrapped all the ones they can and now they're cellulose free. Now they're cellulose free. Hello dear listener and welcome to Cellulose Free. My name is Colin and with me as always is my fellow film watcher, compadre and son, Thomas. Hi, hello. What have you been up to? Well, I I did some more work on bringing the database up to date. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't finish because I got distracted <laughs> by other things that were more interesting. Well, I, I noticed you didn't get finished because no. the film that we're watching tonight isn't updated in the database. No, well... I hadn't pulled it down to. <laughs> you hadn't got to I will this get one. to other things at <laughs> other points. Right now, I just like to focus on the stacks that are in my room when I get to them. <laughs> I thought, oh, I'm going to check this just to mm. to see what was I checking? Oh, the the aspect ratio, and I thought, oh, Thomas will have updated that one because no. that would have been one of the first he'd do. No, it wasn't. No. Because it wasn't on my radar. I thought it was last week during no. the podcast. We said, no, it oh, was. that one needs it, doing. It. <laughs> well and truly on the radar when we say, oh, that one definitely needs doing. It was not on the list of things <laughs> that I was hoping to accomplish at that time. <laughs> it fell off the radar. It was an episode of Schlagden Star. Language. I've had um, to bleep that out every single episode you've mentioned it. And it was it was a good episode. Um, it, it, only a short one, though. It continued at a very reasonable pace. Sometimes these episodes can get a little bogged down in the celebrities hemming and whoring over answers to one of the various trivia games that pop up but no they answered reasonably quickly the physical games there wasn't too much faffing about dodgeball maybe could have done without very large field and only one person either side of it <laughs> what um <laughs> not oh dear. not the greatest but it it's it, sort of like anti-tennis <laughs> yeah um, but it was properly tense towards the end of the show, unrelated to the dodgeball. And it was it was good. It was evenly matched. Both celebrities would have deserved to win it. And one of them, one of them did. did win right. the 100,000 euros. Wow. The call-in and lose competition, which happens every episode for some car or other. Usually, to make it somewhat of a skill game your options are that the winner will win a hundred thousand euros and some sort of obviously wrong option so you call in and you submit one of these two options and the second option this time around was nothing that the winner of this episode would win nothing (laughs) good they're usually a little more creative than that Uh but um this time the second option was Nothing. But yeah, it was a good episode. Good. I had a good time. All five hours of it. Yeah. With no subtitles. With no subtitles. In German. Mm Mm-hmm. But you watched it with friends. Yes. And somebody in amongst that friends group uh, was there to translate everything. Well, all all that you really need to know is the titles of the various games and maybe some of the, the questions. And yes, we do have people for that, but... The titles of the games come up in big letters on the screen and you can hurriedly type them into Google Translate. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'd use Google Lens and just aim aim it at the screen with my phone. Yeah, but then you've got to hold up your phone until... (laughs) Is it coming yet? Is it coming? Oh, yep. Sharp zoom in on Elton's face. We're going to... Yep, there it is. There's the title of the game. Yep, great. So anything else you've been up to? Uh, honestly, no. Right. No. Um, I am aching. Yeah. Because I have just mown the lawn. Mm-hmm. And that was quite exhausting. We've got such a big block. I mean, I've mentioned that before. And it hasn't grown any smaller since no, I last mowed. No, it has not. Mode. 
and <laughs> finally bit the bullet and got a blower because we're on a corner blocks and and mm. there's a footpath that goes right around and I always feel a bit nervous about having grass clippings all over that footpath which is a public path I don't want to cause anyone's death by <laughs> tripping on grass clippings so I bit the bullet and bought a blower so that I could just blow the clippings back onto our lawn so I had to go to a hardware store to get that and got that came back only to find that the whippersnipper didn't have any uh, cord on it so right <laughs> so I just mowed so the edges aren't as nice as I'd like them. But. The blower has a manual, and on the front of that manual, it amusingly lists the components of this blower, which is the blower and a tube to go on the blower. And a battery and a charger. No, those aren't listed on the front. I'm sure they were. No. I, they must have been, because I had to check that, because a lot of these things don't actually come with mm. a charger and a battery. So it must have been on there somewhere. Wasn't on the front of the manual. Oh, on the manual. No. Oh, sorry. My bad. Because they probably use the same manual. Because I think you can buy this particular blower just as the body without the battery. Anyway, isn't this exciting stuff? Yeah, this is... Uh, went for a good bush walk with dear listener Helen and mm -hmm. uh, took some photos of some wonderful waterfalls and some plants and moss and lichen. And lichen, I didn't. Lichen. Pronounce it how you will. Um, other than that, I think we should just get on with this, yeah, shall we? probably. We have a film <laughs> to watch. And following on from last week's uh, little effort from Terry Gilliam, Thomas has selected a, another Terry Gilliam film that's on the shelf, mm -hmm. which is... Time Bandits, the two-disc special edition. It is a two-disc special edition, and the most special thing about that special edition is the fact that it's in 1.77 to 1 ratio. That's 16 by 9. It is a 16 yeah. by 9. Uh, whereas the previous copy that I had was the... I'm guessing they just transferred the VHS copy straight onto a, a disc because it was the 4x3 pan and scan and it was awful. And I don't think I've watched this since getting it and replacing the 4x3, so I'm quite looking forward to right. to seeing it in a, both 16x9 and with a 5.1 soundtrack. But no subtitles. Really? No. Huh. <laughs> There's commentaries. Yeah. It's got some audio commentaries, but no subtitles. Mm. Wow. That's poor. Subtitles, very useful when you're listening to commentaries, but no such luck. Would you... Be mm. so kind as to tell our dear listener the plot synopsis according to the back of this DVD case. When young, imaginative Kevin is abducted by a band of mischievous dwarves, it's the first step in a long and fantastical journey through time. Locating holes in the space-time continuum, the dwarves, with Kevin in tow, plan to traverse the ages, looting the fortunes of the richest and most famous figures in history. Their bizarre and hilarious adventures bring them face to face with the likes of King Agamemnon, Robin Hood, and Napoleon. But, unknown to the diminutive time bandits, their exploits are being observed by the spectre of the, the evil, evil genius. genius. Was that it? Sure. Good. Yeah, that was it. Thomas is going to take the disc out of its case, because it is in the case. Mm -hmm. He's going to stick it into the DVD player. We are going to watch it, and we'll come back and talk about it. So we'll catch you on the flip side. Turn to side B. I don't think we have time. Oh, we don't? No. Oh, that's it's been stolen by the time uh, bandits, you probably. mongrel. So what did you think? It's all right. It's certainly not perfect. It, no. Like last week, we have a film with some good bits surrounded by some slow bits. Yeah, it's very much a, a case of everything could have been trimmed back just a little bit. But I've got this footage. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got to use it. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked very hard for this footage. Yeah, yeah. A and and for these people. Yeah. So uh, all of these people signed on and are helping me out. So let's make sure that they get their screen time. Um, yeah. So it could have been tightened up. But, oh, look, it's... 
<laughs> I love this film. <laughs> it's a nostalgic film for me. It's one of the first films that I went off to the pictures just with a friend, you know, with, with no adults, and then had a day in town and wandering around. And it was just... So, so there's nostalgic times connected mm-hmm. with it. And I think it was the first time that I had been hit with the Monty Python-esque humour and absurdity. Certainly English comedy had been very much a staple of my television diet growing up. But I think Monty Python was too adult and so wasn't exposed to that very much. So I saw this before I saw any any Monty Python. And so it's completely in the opposite order to people five, ten years prior to my generation, I think. So I then had that to look forward to and, and be disappointed with and, and be amazed with. And, and very much this film reflects the not quite balanced nature of all all of Monty Python is that some things stick really well and, and work really well mm-hmm. and others fall for very very flat as far as um, some of the Monty Python skits are concerned um, there wasn't all that much flatness of things working in this just things that went on for too long I love Ian Holm uh, again being a regular feature by the looks of things <laughs> His Napoleonic period segment, that went for too long, but was good. Um, Mm -hmm. It just could have been trimmed back a bit. I do have a few notes. Yes, I made some notes too. But all all of my notes are whitewashed with that nostalgia. But I think my appreciation for it again this time, it reflects, I guess, the... I don't want to say brilliance but smart filmmaking and smart filmmaking with what would have been not a great budget, but... um, Right. Yes, what have you got? So, I'm just going to randomly flick through... I shall grab my my notes and see and and mark off everything that you you steal from me. Completely randomly flip through them, Mm -hmm. not in any particular order. All right, then Um, we might go back and forth then. Yeah. Vincent and Pansy... (laughs) <laughs> uh, uh, played by Michael Palin and Shelley Duval. Yes. It's a good bit, but it doesn't have a third beat. No. No, I, I, I have often... Wa- and my memory was such that I thought there was a third beat going into the film. Uh, uh, mm. Again, waiting for that third beat to happen. And we, it doesn't. We see them in the Middle Ages. Yep. We see them on the Titanic. And then... And then we go to the Land of Legend, and there's no reason for us to... I will admit that sitting on the shelf somewhere is the original screenplay. I'd have to scour through that as to whether there was a third beat that had been cut. There was a huge amount of changes made constantly (laughs) throughout production, um, making large segments of the screenplay, um, they don't exist in the film. But I can't remember whether in the screenplay, because I, I have read it. <laughs> it's actually a wonderful book. It's got a whole heap of uh, Terry Gilliam's um, illustrations throughout this this screenplay and, and pictures. And But I can't remember whether there was a third beat as far as uh, Shelley Duval and Michael Palin's little cameos yeah. are concerned. <laughs> Time cameos. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pinch what I still think is possibly one of the most brilliant scenes, I, I guess. Um, it's more than that. The cage, the hanging cage sequence. Such a bare bones. Yeah. <laughs> I say that with a, somewhat of a pun. It's three cages and some three rope. cages hanging from rope in complete darkness. But the way that it is shot is such that you get this feeling that it's an absolute massive drop below, mm. and also that the ceiling is many, many, many meters above 
it's just shot really really well camera angles are great um the the swinging and the the sequences where force perspective and and uses of uh, miniatures is quite amazing as well with the the distance swinging and i love it it just <laughs> it's, a, it's a great sequence that that on its own makes this film worth watching <laughs> A joke is made on the Titanic about Greece. <laughs> I was wondering whether you'd and you'd right and that. and having <laughs> quote unquote the lowest standard of living. It was a joke then, and it's still true now. Yes, it was a joke then because it was true then. Yeah, <laughs> and and yes, poor old Greece has. <laughs> Considering Greece's might and glory <laughs> in the ancient world, uh, they have struggled and continue to struggle. And I would not want to be a country in Europe, I must admit. Uh, too much <laughs> happens there. Yeah, yeah. All right. The objects in the bedroom. Yes. Kevin's bedroom is absolutely chock full with typical 10 or 11 year old. I, th- I think he was portraying a 10 or 11 year old and he probably was 10 or 11 when he did it a typical bedroom floor of a 10 or 11 year old in the early 80s mm-hmm. late 70s lego blocks and, and soldier toy soldiers and cowboys and and a skeleton hanging from the mm-hmm. wall and every single one of these things appears most concentrated in the the final scenes where the, mm. the the good versus evil battle occurs. And I love that. And, and it's introduced, especially in that place of ultimate evil, introduced quite subtly to begin with, and then suddenly there's this full barrage. And I remember sitting in the theatre going, yes. It, <laughs> the, the, the first thing that was exposed was the Lego blocks mm-hmm. in dark relief the the only way that you can tell it isn't just this evil castle is the prominent studs prominent studs on the, the top of these blocks and yeah and then it just goes on from there everything in real life just blurring those lines about what is real absolutely elsewhere in the fortress we have evil's main office room <laughs> everything's covered in plastic yeah <laughs> Um, but it, again, did you notice mm. that his father and mother's mm-hmm. seats were yeah. covered in plastic? <laughs> and then we drag in the You Bet Your Life host yep. and... The, Jim Broadbent, who yeah, Jim was Broadbent. Also, also in uh, Brazil. And the kitchenette commercial. Yes, Moderna. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> And keeping on that theme of what is real, almost everyone that we meet along the way is people who would have been in one or another of Kevin's books. Yes, right from the start, where he recognises Napoleon and he recognises Agamemnon. And And Robin Hood. And Robin Hood, yes. (laughs) He's my hero. (laughs) My mind had forgotten John Cleese's... (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> such, a, <laughs> such an ineffective person out, out being of the placed square. there. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Robin Hood, as you don't remember him. <laughs> <It's>, and <laughs> uh, but it works. And we meet Hagen Memnon, played by Sean Connery. Played brilliantly by yes. Sean Connery. And then later, right at the end, we meet a fireman, who is also Sean, Sean Connery. Connery. And gives a wink at Kevin as, as Which he also off. gave when he was Agamemnon. Right. Which I hadn't picked up ever before, I don't think. But, um, yeah, he gives Kevin the wink during the scenes with Ag- Agamemnon as well. So, yeah, what is real? Yeah. <laughs> is he still dreaming? I hope so, because spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> His parents just exploded. Yeah. There are a few explosions in this film. <laughs> yeah, lots of <laughs> wonderful, wonderful explosions, um, <laughs> including when the evil genius gets to a point where he doesn't need his minions anymore, he decides, and so he <laughs> blows them all up. Um, and once <laughs> and he's done so, he says, Now, I'm a reasonable man. <laughs> <laughs> and, and right before, he's like, Okay, so specific minion, it's time. Oh, thank you, Master. 
<laughs> also in that what is real idea, this is another very pointedly critical of consumerism film. Very much so. So many products. And how many of them work? Uh, who, who's to say? Go buy some new stuff. Go. Yeah, we should have got the better one. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but at least I got a two-speed hedge trimmer. The, the father's digital watch tells mm. him every night when to send Kevin to bed. And later on, the evil genius wants to learn all about digital watches. Mm. And subscriber so, track dialing. Down. Yes. <laughs> Tell me about computers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your money and you, or your life is a terrible show that under various different names has been done various times yes i don't understand how it keeps happening why <laughs> why because the price is right to make it it is a very cheap show yeah. to make because yeah. the prizes are advertisements in themselves so mm. th th that's how they get the prizes there's some really, really classic lines in it too. One of which has always stuck with me uh, during the, the final battle when you've got two of the time bandits controlling a, a tank and a small ride in spaceship <laughs> uh, or supposedly controlling until they find out they're not and one of them yells out, I can't control it. And the evil genius played marvellously by David Warner uh, says, of course you can't, you silly little man. I control them. He's, he's just... <laughs> Another great line from Evil. One of his minions asks, so if you're all-powerful, why are you sticking around here in this, this awful place? Why aren't you going out and doing things and... <laughs> It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then probably within five minutes of that, whilst he's, he's chatting away, he, he waves his <laughs> explosive hands accidentally <laughs> and you, you, you ah! hear this explosion off and, and a scream from off, off, off camera. And then he says, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> In the time of legends, we meet an ogre and his wife... I didn't write it down anything in relation to that. It's just a, a very silly sequence of events. Yeah. Again, a couple of fairly well-known at the time uh, actors who were given some screen time and just absolutely ran with their parts. Yeah. And it was glorious to be followed up very closely by one of those wonderful Terry Gilliam shots of obviously a person <laughs> mm. to appear very, very, very large. Um, yeah. uh, it, beautifully, beautifully done. You, you know that that is what is happening, mm. but it it works so it well, uh, especially where so he, absurd. <laughs> especially when he steps on <laughs> this little hovel of a house with a husband and wife arguing, and I'm totally oblivious to the fact that they're about to uh, meet their demise. <laughs> Did you notice? No. Right at the end, that the two pairs of smoking shoes the smoke was flowing backwards mm, yes into the shoes yes yeah the the way the camera cranes up you, you watch kevin as he is walking towards and and neighbors are watching and i picked up because i, I re remember that sequence quite well apart from the fact that every time i watch it the smoke thing going back into the shoes rather than coming out of the shoes uh, go, oh, that's cool. Well, this time around, I'd forgotten about the smoke. I was just watching Kevin's steps, and I'm thinking, there's something strange going on there. And then, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, ah, oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, so, so that's actually a, a, a crane down yes. shot, yep. not a crane up. All filmed backwards. Or, <laughs> sorry, it was played backwards. Mm. Yes, as we go into yes, uh, George Harrison's uh, yeah. wonderful closing song. It's a weird song. It is a weird song, but it it fits quite well, and it again shows the. Uh, I think he may even have been a co-producer. I could be making that up. Why does that um, ring a bell? Yeah, but I um, seem to recall that George Harrison was... So, one of the production companies was Handmade Films. Yep. And Handmade Films, apart from 
more recently getting into financial difficulties and legal difficulties because the directors were misusing funds. But oh, shame. Mm-hmm. Um, back then, it was formed by George Harrison and Dennis O'Brien to finance Life of Brian. Yep. <laughs> yes. It's all in the family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes. So. Dragging things back to consumerism, as one does constantly. The last piece of evil ends up in the oven. Yep. That wonderful oven. <laughs> <laughs> Mum, Dad, don't touch it. Uh, I think I've run out of notes. I, I've run out of notes yeah. too. I, I really do like this film. Unfortunately, I don't think it's streaming anywhere. No, um, I think I checked at some point and I just came up with um, rentals and purchases, yep. which isn't very helpful if you don't want to rent or purchase. No, no. But I, I was very happy with the DVD. Mm. It, it certainly was a much cleaner, not just the fact that the the left and right sides of the, yeah. <laughs> the image had been lopped off, but uh, yes, um, it was a, I- quite, a, quite a crisp... Opening title's a bit shaky, but that, I think, is just a function of opening, opening titles, titles being shaky yeah. back then. Yep. But if you can get your hands on it and you haven't seen it, be, be prepared for it to be slow in mm-hmm. the early 80s way, plus the Terry Gilliam. Yeah. <laughs> Make it just a little bit longer. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on then. The following segment has no title. Thank you. I'm not sure there's a lot to move on to here. No. Dear listener, Helen did make a comment from last week's episode. Mm -hmm. She's not really into dystopian films, so we'll probably give it a miss. As I mentioned earlier, um, I'd actually gone for a bushwalk with her. And it suddenly dawned on me the best way to describe it to her that may make her change her mind as far as watching it or not. Um, (laughs) I said, imagine if Douglas Adams wrote 1984. Yeah. I I think that... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah? Good. All right. Um, So nothing else from your hidden realm? I can't recall, and I don't think there was anyway. So I think we may have to just move on. All right, then. Let's move on, then. Pick a film for next week. So we can go to bed. It's your turn. It is my turn. So I've been having a bit of a think this week. Uh, Mm -hmm. This week, a quite famous actor passed away. Mm-hmm. Sydney Poitier. Yep. I don't know whether you've seen any Sydney Poitier films. I don't think I have. No. Okay. So very famous for the fact that in 1964 he was the first African American and first Bahamian to win the Academy Award for Best Actor. Very long history of of films and broke a whole bunch of boundaries and and did some amazing things. I think we might watch a Sydney Poitier film and. Okay. I haven't quite decided which one yet. Right. That sounds a bit vague. I do have one on its way at the moment. Right. So that is going to influence which way it is going to go. So if that film gets here because it's not streaming anywhere, we will watch that one. If not, we might watch another one. Right. Okay. That's... (laughs) That's all very helpful. <laughs> it, it is. Well, okay, so I've got two films on the shelf, uh, I believe. I think there is only two on the shelf with him. You can find out for yeah, that. I think those are both it's a box somewhere set. in the stack of things yes. that I've been running through at the moment. Yep. I have Sir With Love, mm-hmm. which I actually watched in English in grade nine, I think it was. And Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, both films of which he's uh, quite, quite famous for. There is one more. Is there? There is one more. Oh, of course there is. Mm Mm-hmm. Sneakers? Yes, that is the other one. Mmm. Oh, that makes it really difficult. I've not seen Sneakers. You have. I haven't. (laughs) And it should be on my list, to be frank. Uh, I'm not frank. Oh, you're frank. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, it's not on my list either. Yeah, that's... Uh... Oh. Okay, so it's either going to be Sneakers, mm-hmm. or if this film arrives, it's going to be that film. Right. And I'm not telling you what that film is. Okay. <laughs> and potentially, if that film does arrive, then you sound like you're keen to watch Sneakers. Mm. We may watch that yeah. the following week, but I'm, I cannot make that decision for you. I'm genuinely surprised it didn't make it onto my list. I'm surprised it didn't reach mine either. Yeah. So, is everyone confused? Yeah. <laughs> Good. We're watching yeah. a Sydney Point here film, either or Sneakers. You know what your problem is? You got too many secrets. I I know <laughs> that much. <laughs> that much. I've got too many secrets. Yeah, you've got too many secrets. You know that I've got too many secrets. Yeah. You know that much. Yeah. Well, I could tell you what they are. Right. But then I'd have to kill you. Oh. Yeah. So, next week, a Sydney Poitier special, which may be followed by another Sydney Poitier special. We hope that you can join us when we sit down and watch one of those films. But until then, we'll catch you next time. Bye. You have been listening to Cellulose Free. Your hosts were Colin, who produces and edits the show, and Thomas, who makes the artwork and music. Cellulose Free is recorded in the Deranged Cat Studios in scenic Tasmania, Australia. We keep track of our extensive physical media collection through My Movies, which we highly recommend. You can find links to that, as well as other places you can find us in the show notes. Cellulose Free is a Hi Hello production. Secrets. Uh, it's the only sneakers reference I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, I've seen it <laughs> a number of times, and I don't remember that line. Is it on the front cover? No, no. Right. It's just the only sneakers <laughs> reference I know. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Good. We'll watch that. Sometimes that's a sneakers reference. Yes, it's a sneakers reference. Right. <laughs> good. Good, good, good. Oh, I'm still recording. Let's yeah. stop that. That's that's what happens if you don't hit the button. Which button? The red one. This one? No, the red button. No, is the red no, button. that one. Not that the not one. red the, button. The not red button. If don't <laughs> is hit that it. one over there. If you don't hit it, it doesn't <laughs> stop. <laughs> It'll never, never stop. <laughs> And our dear listeners are saying, make it stop, make it stop. And so he did.